all about how will we make it happen? Make sure the vehicles have a place to land, make sure they're safe, make sure there are the right vehicles. And all of that will happen in stages. We're not going to work on it for years and years secretly and then lift the curtain and there is full urban air mobility. But what are these stages going to be? And I talk about this today, of course, as always with Corvin Huber, CEO of D3 Technologies. Hi, Corvin, you're doing okay? Hello, excellent. Thank you and welcome everyone. <laughs> and then special guest today is Jan Hendrik Böns. He's the former chief technology officer for Volocopter. Fantastic to have you. And then um, uh, Jan Hendrik Corvin, what are these stages going to be and which stage are we in at the moment? A good question, Andreas. I I think there are as many stages as there are topics, and, and we can go through some of them. Um, let's let let's look at where this might go, and kind of where and and and, and of course, excellent question. Where where are we today? Um, there is no urban air mobility today, or there's hardly any urban air mobility today. Um, what what is called a drone nowadays is largely limited to open field operations. So there's very little flying in towns at this point in time, and all that needs to change over the future, of course. So the stages are defined by how different aspects of the industry develop. And um, let's just mention a few here. Um, it's the capability of the vehicles. It's the number and capacity of landing spots. It's the air traffic management. It's the use models that um, fleet operators offer um, their customers. Jan Hendrik, can you think of more? Um, there are um, there is the the energy supply for landing spots. What else needs to develop in stages? Um, I think if, if I if I may add to that, um, I think it's very instructive to look at where we are today uh, in terms of uh, as you mentioned, Corbin, there is very little uh, urban air mobility, but there is some that we can actually learn from. Um, I mean, we have uh, companies like Blade and Ubercopter uh, operating in the cities like New York. Um, up until uh, a few years ago, we had Voom operating in Sao Paulo. And um, th there might probably be a few more that, that we didn't mention yet, but um, th we can actually, by looking at what they're doing, I think we can already learn a lot about what needs to be addressed going forward. Um, what specifically do you see? What can we already learn from what they're doing in their operations? Well, wh why, why is it that um, these helicopter-based helicopter uh, urban air mobility services are not used today um, for, uh, for larger scale urban air mobility? I mean, one aspect is clearly noise. And I explicitly put that in, in the first position because um, helicopters, you know, pe people tend to complain about helicopter noise. If it's flying over your house, you don't like them. Um, so noise is one of the key issues that already we have a lot of experience with from existing helicopter operations in cities. And so we know uh, what is not acceptable and we have to get to levels that, that actually are tolerable, that are acceptable. Um, a second aspect is safety. And um, I'm just going to bring up some, some examples to illustrate that point. I mean, everybody knows at least one celebrity that, that died in a helicopter crash, uh, whether it's Kobe Bryant or whether recently, I think this week it was Olivier Dassault. Um, it, it, it's just, it happens every time and again that there are safety incidents with helicopters. Um, if you operate these things at scale in, inside the city, um, I think it will, uh, if, if we don't improve the safety benchmark there, it will very quickly lead to a situation um, that, uh, that is not acceptable, uh, of course. To let's let, let's bring maybe Corvin in here, uh, because uh, Corvin, we, we do have urban air mobility and people seem to accept the risk with it. Some people die in helicopter crashes. How much safer does urban air mobility have to become to take off? Um, well, Jan, thank you, uh, Jan Hendrik, thank you for kind of pointing out that there is urban air mobility today. And, and that also points, Andreas, to the, the interesting confusion of terms that we have today, because usually when people talk about urban air mobility as a name for a future transport mode, they are largely looking at 
kind of electric or alternatively driven um, vertical takeoff and landing vehicles. And Jan Henrik, you're absolutely right. Of course, there is there there are numerous operations. There's there's a very large helicopter community in Southeast Asia operating in cities. Um, there's Jetcopter in in Vancouver operating 30 aircraft within a city. So yes, I, there there is urban air mobility, uh, safety, Andreas. Um, we all all know that commercial aviation is one of the safest forms of transport, and and still. Um, it is shocking to the public when an aircraft every other year has an incident that claims lives. It's highly publicized, um, whereas accidents and other modes of transport are not as highly publicized. Um, I'm not quite sure why that is. It has something to do with the fact that it's usually several people who get hurt at the same time, which makes for publicity. But we in the industry believe that in the long term, um, urban air mobility will have to comply to even stricter safety standards than present aviation. And that being already at a very, very high level. So what we're looking at today is that um, there are um, less than 10 to the minus nine um, fatal incidents per operating cycle or per flight hour in commercial aviation. But if you scale that up to city type transportation, where the numbers of hours flown or the numbers of cycles, the numbers of landing and takeoff cycles will increase substantially over what is done in standard aviation today, we will have to look at even um, tighter uh, safety requirements and tolerances. So I would not be safety levels of 10 to the minus 10, 10 to my, the minus 11 um, for urban air mobility in the future which from an engineering point of view is a, a, a true feat. I mean, that, that is going to take substantial engineering to get there. Okay, so it makes it even harder. What I'd, what I'd love to do with you before we open up the floor for everybody is give us an idea of the stages that you expect. We are currently, let's call it maybe in the embryonic state where we have traditional helicopters fly around, but then we see some basic um, use cases um, where like ship to shore, short flight. So what do we have today in the embryonic stage beyond helicopters? I would, I would think that, um, well, first, of course, it's very difficult to say exactly how that will be. But in the first uh, stages, you would expect um, that people will start picking the low hanging fruits. Um, so personally, I would expect that to be operations in an environment that is relatively simple, not uh, not too risky and be mainly point to point uh, connection or even round circuit con uh, connections. I mean, it's not hard to imagine people really wanting to make this experience in the beginning and even, uh, even a round flight around the city center could be, uh, could be something that is attractive to people okay. or very simple point to point connections. Okay. But I also but think it, it, will, it, it will very quickly scale to high volume routes, which will then be point to point um, connections classic uh, one would be the city center connected to the airport or to a business district, something like that. Okay, so to, to trace this back, at the moment, embryonic stage, it's those small 10 minute flights over land where you can have emergency landings. Is, 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 is that right or did I get that wrong? Well, I, I think where, where Jan Henrik is also going is that the routing complexity initially will be fairly low key. It means that um, individual Aircraft will be servicing known routes, routes from from given takeoff and landing spots to to other uh, given takeoff and landing spots. So we won't be having kind of um, very kind of wild traffic with intersecting routes and crossings and and multiple aircraft types landing at at the same landing spot or or vertiport as they call as we call them. So the the operations prints uh, the operation complexity will be fairly low. Uh, imagine kind of a dedicated tram line with a dedicated starting station and end station and the tram running to and fro. That will be kind of an initial type of operation. Jan Henrik, is, is that what I'm hearing from you? Right. I think you have to see it from a practical point of view. The, the regulator also will want to gain practical experience, empirical experience with these, these new types of vehicles in, in these new types of operations. So I would imagine that the easiest, most straightforward way to do that is to set up some um, dedicated routes that are well-defined and well-known mm -hmm. 
uh, where these things can, can be tried in, uh, in practical conditions before scaling uh, to, to a larger extent. When should we expect that? Well, I think there are, there are very uh, public uh, dates being, uh, uh, being published by multiple e diesel companies about when these aircraft will be available to enter service. So I think uh, that's generally 2024, 2025. And I see no reason why that shouldn't be. Uh, Andreas, um, the, the complexity of the routing is one dimension in which will evolve in stages. Another, another um, dimension, another technical aspect is the question of transport capacity. For instance, the number of passengers that can be carried, which is dependent on the size of vehicles and the energy density of batteries. But even more than that, something that is going to be looked at very carefully very soon is in a vehicle which potentially could carry two individuals, if one of them is a pilot, you're losing half of your payload and half of re your revenue capacity. So there will be substantial effort invested into being able to get rid of or, or work without a pilot on board the aircraft. So there will be interim stages where um, aircraft will be remotely piloted by a human from the ground and then maybe another stage where the entire operation will be computer controlled. So that's another dimension in which we will see, see several rollouts in stages. Yeah, and that you led a team that, that was all about building such a vehicle, getting rid of the pilot. What's your take on that? Um, well, th th there's two things. One is, yes, getting rid of the pilot. Uh, that, that is from a commercial point of view, certainly, um, uh, a target that would make a lot of sense. Uh, from a technical point of view, uh, I would say let's make sure we first get piloted aircraft in, in, in the air before we remove the pilot again um, and then take it one step at a time. What I would like to point out though uh, there as well is that um, what's, what's often overseen that is not just about the vehicles, it's about the, the entire ecosystem, the system that you need um, to operate these, uh, these types of services. I mean, if, you, if you're flying one or two e vehicles inside a city, maybe that doesn't require a huge infrastructure. But once this starts scaling up, uh, of course, we will need some kind of air traffic management, ATM, UTM to support uh, these, these kind of operations, especially if you start operating uh, uh, shuttle services to an airport, for example, which is a very complex airspace environment. Uh, if you want to integrate these new services and vehicles in that environment uh, with the specific um, um, features, uh, then, then that will require also new solutions there. Corvin, lucky we are lucky to have you because you're working on exactly that. But same thing with the air traffic uh, management solutions. We're not going to work on them for years secretly and unveil. How is that going to develop in stages? Well, Andreas, very much along the lines we've just been discussing. So basically, um, conceivably, a vehicle could um, master a point-to-point -point connection uh, with fairly traditional um, uh, aviation navigation. But as we as we progress, um, the even the piloted vehicle uh, could be guided by an air traffic management system, at least that's the way um, D3 sees it. So basically, initially, uh, an aircraft would fly much as a helicopter does today with a pilot who observes his environment and makes his own navigation decisions. Um, at a, and the next step, the pilot would be aided by um, visual clues that instruments give him to follow a certain route. Um, and in a, in a next step, the pilot might just be sitting there and observing what the vehicle does when it follows that route. And at a certain point in time, the pilot will be there for safety purposes only. So there are evolutions here and, um, and an adequate air traffic control system would be, pro would be there to provide the vehicles with the cues and um, directions that it needs um, to fly the route. Um, and here again, there are different technological stage gates. Um, quite interesting, and, and, and some of our audience may be able to relate to that. Um, presently, the navigation performance of, of traditional aircraft is down to about 
one tenth of a mile. That means that you can position an aircraft reasonably accurately in the sky with about 185 meters to the right and to the left. So basically every aircraft needs to operate in a corridor that's almost 400 meters wide. So as long as you're talking about every little vehicle carrying a 400 meter bubble around it, you will immediately understand that that does not lend itself to very tight or kind of congested type traffic. Um, so another stage gate we will have in urban navigation is navigation accuracy. And it's becoming increasingly obvious that standard um, GPS, uh, global navigation, st satellite navigation systems will not provide that, at least not exclusively. They will be need to be backed up by secondary systems or so-called dissimilar systems. And uh, uh, work is being done on that. So what am I saying? If we want to get to denser traffic, more complex traffic, more involved traffic, traffic with vehicles in closer proximity to each other, it's not only the management system itself that needs to evolve or the traffic planning. There are some very fundamental technological issues that need to be solved. One of them being um, location services um, in order to position aircraft more accurately in the sky. Jan Hendrik, um, do, do you, uh, can, what, what is the timeline that, that is in your mind kind of for, for navigation services? Is when in, in, in your previous work, were you aware of kind of a planning for increased navigational capability or are you only aware of kind of working with present navigational accuracy? Well, obviously I can't comment on my previous work, <laughs> um, but um, from, from, from the um, perspective that I have um, is that certainly navigation is going to be a, a, a key issue uh, scaling up. The beauty of the entire system to me is that it can de develop very um, elegantly, very naturally and incrementally in that uh, we can start uh, with a relatively simple system using uh, systems that, that are, have a, an initial limited capability and then build on that essentially, adding capabilities, adding functionality and adding uh, the required level of, of, of sophistication as we go along. And I think that will be a very natural process. Now, for everybody in the audience, if you want to jump in, if you have questions, if you want to contribute, just raise your hand. We'll pull you in in a couple of minutes. But Carvin, I heard you you wanted to react to Jan Hendrik right away. No, I I, um, I, I agree with uh, Jan Hendrik that there will be kind of natural progression along a, a number of, of kind of development routes that we've already mentioned here. So I, kind of it, it, it's becoming obviously that urban air mobility is a composite effort of, of different technological developments, um, navigation being one, routing algorithms being another, vehicle capability being one more. A another issue out there is um, landing port capability. Um, some of you listening will have seen the pictures are a kind of artist's impressions of vertiports. Um, they range from very simple helicopter type pads to um, multi-vehicle pads with elevators where drones land and um, get um, uh, pulled away um, to underground storage where they are serviced, uh, um, recharged, and then they emerge again to the surface. So it's, it, it's already obvious that, that people are thinking about how to increase a pad capability and I personally actually believe that pad capability is going to be a fairly significant contributor to the number of vehicles that can be operated in a given environment because actually the landing pads will be more congested than the sky. Um, Jan Henrik, would you agree or, or do you see that differently? In the urban environment, um, yes, real estate comes at a very high premium, so that's going to be uh, a uh... A very valuable resource, which needs, to, which also means that the aircraft can't stay on the ground. They have to be in the air, uh, not just to conserve space on the ground, but also to be making money. Because we, we haven't touched on the economics in the, in the previous bits, uh, but in the end, if, if if this is going to be more than, uh, than than a luxury option to get around town for you know the the, the top one percent, if this is really going to be something that's economically viable for many people uh, to to use then the key to that is going to be scale. 
Uh, only if this can operate at scale in high volumes, high asset utilization rates, can this really be operated at, at the right cost point. And I think that is going to be key in, uh, in, in, in really making that a successful business.